This project is on the epistemology of St. Thomas Aquinas. So before we begin, we'll just give a little introduction on uh, the life of St. Thomas. I'm sure most people know a good bit about him, but it's, it's helpful. So St. Thomas was born in the year 1224 near Naples at the castle of Roca Seca to the Count and Countess of Aquino. His parents sent him to the Benedictine Abbey of Monte Cassino at the age of five to become an oblate, where he was eventually pushed out by Frederick II, a very controversial figure. Uh, after doing some, some studies, he entered the Order of Preachers in 1244 after a great resistance from his family. Everybody knows the story of him being, being locked in the tower by his family and sending in the prostitute so as to prevent him from, from entering the order. After finally escaping the tower, St. Thomas would go on to study under St. Albert the Great, uh, who was another great saint and doctor of the church, obviously, and would continue to teach and would go on to teach at Cologne, Paris, the Studium Curie, Curie attached to the papal court. Throughout his life, he wrote, obviously, just a ton of stuff. You could fill libraries with, with what, just on his writings, original things from the Summa Theologiae, which is considered his greatest, Summa Contra Gentiles, De Reno, a bunch of other things, um, philosophical commentaries on, on Aristotle, biblical commentaries on the Gospels of Matthew and John, the Pauline Epistles, and then his probably his most famous theological commentary is on the sentences of Peter Lombard. St. Thomas was also in tasked with composing the hit composing the office for the feast of Corpus Christi and those hymns are extremely beautiful. I think they really go to show that St. Thomas was not just some nerdy philosopher, but the man loved Jesus Christ with every fiber of his being. He had mystical experiences throughout his life. Everyone knows everyone knows the story of him saying mass and Christ appearing to him and, and saying, uh, you have written well of me, Thomas, what shall be your reward? And he said, in response, non nisi te domine, which is nothing but you, O Lord. And I think St. Thomas was really able to write what he wrote based on the manner in which he lived. It wasn't just he was endowed with great intelligence, because obviously he was. He was one of the smartest, if not the smartest man ever to live. Um... But the manner in which he lived his life really enabled him to write um, these beautiful things about about God and the faith. Um, unfortunately, he died before he could make it to the Council of Lyon on March seventh, twelve seventy four, at the monast at the Cistercian Monastery of Falsanova, um, where he composed a commentary on the song on the Canticle of Canticles, which is unfortunately lost to this day. So Saint Thomas is. By far one of my my favorite saints. I'd say he's one of my my top three favorite saints, and I could talk about him all day, but alas, we do not have the time for that. So we begin with the role of the senses in coming to knowledge, um, as that's the foundation for all of our knowledge. So Saint Thomas believes obviously that we can trust our senses, despite the fact that they may be fallible at certain times. Now, of course, obviously our senses can fail us. Um, everyone has experience of their senses failing them. But if we're all the time in constant suspicion of our senses, it's really difficult to, to get anywhere in life. Um, so that's not really much of a, of a point for, of argument for St. Thomas. It's, it's quite clear that we can assume that our senses can be trusted. So obviously knowledge then does begin in the senses through which we, because it's, the mode by which we experience the world around us. We're not born with any innate knowledge, but only the potential to know. Now, all of our experiences are potentially intelligible, and the gift of reason allows us to discover the intelligibility of these experiences and make connections between them. So, the senses are necessary for knowledge, as we've said. We're not born with any innate knowledge. And St. Thomas tells us that if a sense be wanting, the knowledge of what is apprehended through that sense is wanting also. For instance, a man who is born blind can have no knowledge of colors. That's to say that whatever pertains to a certain sense, if that sense is hindered or becomes damaged, 
that the organ in which the the sensory organ I should say if that becomes damaged or uh, faulty obviously we're not going to be able to come to knowledge of the certain thing we don't we're not going to know what what lang we're not going to be able to hear things um, know certain words if we're born deaf and obviously as St. Thomas says you can't know know anything about colors if you are born blind uh, this is not to say that sensing and knowing are the same thing, for there are many instances instances in life where we sense something and we don't know. We don't know its cause. We don't even know what it was. Um, for example, if I look under a microscope at some cells, I'm no biologist by any means whatsoever, uh, so I wouldn't know what those those cells are. Uh, I wouldn't know what animal they belong to or plant for that matter. Um, I just know I wouldn't even necessarily know it's a it's their cells. Um, I would just see you know purple, green, whatever color, squiggly lines. Um, so that this is why Aristotle. But so thinking does not involve the use of the sense organs. So actually n coming to actually knowing in and of itself does not involve the sense organs. That's why Aristotle tells us that the mind must be related to what is thinkable as sense to what is sensible, and we'll get to the intellect uh, obviously later. So, although the intellect is superior to the senses, St. Thomas tells us, nevertheless, in a manner, it receives from the senses, and its first and principal objects are found in sensible things, and therefore the suspension of the senses necessarily involves a hindrance to the judgment of the intellect. So if our senses are damaged, it's going to be more difficult for us to come to know things. Um, and from this it follows that sensible knowledge is not the total and perfect cause of intellectual knowledge, but rather in a way is its material cause, he would tell us. Um, so basically this is, this is to say that material objects act upon the sense organ and we come to know, and the intellect comes to know things through the process of extra abstraction. So now we'll consider the intellect in and of itself. So the intellect is a passive power of the soul, meaning it's in potential to receiving the intelligibility of things, but it doesn't lose anything when acted upon. It does not, neither does it act to make knowledge, but it reacts to the impression of knowledge. It receives knowledge and expresses it within itself in its own way. So being a power of the soul, the intellect is obviously immaterial. Um, one argument we get is from Aristotle. He states that after a strong stimulation of a sense, we are less able to exercise it than before. But in the case of mind thought about an object that is highly intelligible, renders it more and not less able afterwards to think, to think objects that are less intelligible. This is to say that if one of our sense organs experience, experiences an overstimulation, say the eye looking at the sun, that it becomes, the sense organ becomes damaged and the sense impaired. So, if, like I said, if one looks at the sun for too long, their eye is going to become, become damaged and the sense of sight will become impaired over time. However, the intellect, when it thinks of things that are very, that are difficult, when it thinks of difficult concepts or problems, um, it actually is strengthened. And even in the case of thinking about harmful material things such as fire or politicians or Josh Allen's rookie season, it, it doesn't become harmed. But if it thought about any of those three things just mentioned, plus a whole host of other harmful things, it would obviously become damaged. However, it's not. If the intellect were material, it would not be able to conceive of things larger than itself either. For example, an elephant would not fit into the intellect. Because we're able to conceive of the nature of these things, it's, it, you know, the, the actual elephant does not go inside of a material intellect. Such a, you know, proposition is, is ridiculous. But we're able to conceive the nature of an elephant and therefore the intellect is immaterial. Another reason the intellect is immaterial is because it can recognize itself, whereas the senses cannot. 
No physical thing can be present to itself because it has parts, extensions, and limits. So the eye only sees, the ear only hears, and etc. The intellect, however, can be present and can recognize itself and is therefore immaterial. So St. Thomas tells us that there is that there is an active intellect and a passive intellect. So the active intellect, which we'll speak more of in a minute about in when we talk about abstraction, so that it 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 makes the potentially intelligible things actually intelligible and presents them to the passive intellect. So the passive intellect when it receives the universal is what is the intellect that actually understands these things. It's what we would call the intellect proper. And now we'll see how, how this process works in abstraction. So now we'll talk about <clears throat> abstraction in the intellect. So to abstract means to isolate intellectually the universal part from the particularizing notes. So how exactly does this process work? So first the senses are stimulated by some sensation, some, some outside object. And this external stimulation forms in the mind the sensible species or phantasm of this object. So the phantasm provides us basically it's just a it's just the image of the particular object in the in the mind. The active intellect then takes this phantasm, abstracts from the phantasm all that is particular. That is to say, as E.Q. McInerney states, it divests the phantasm of everything that is material and singular and abstracts from it the basic nature of the thing. Paul J. Glenn, the Jesuit, tells us, the active intellect impresses the abstracted essence or species upon the passive intellect, and the passive intellect reacts to the impression by expressing the essence within itself as a concept or an idea. So this is to say that the active intellect impresses this universal or intelligible species on the passive intellect, and by this we come to know the nature or essence of the thing. And from this the mind conceives an idea, like I said, an essence, a universal, not merely, uh, not, not merely just an individual. Um, and the intellectual act is then brought to completion in the act of judgment. So we will take for an example um, the bilby. So you walk up one morning, you wake up one morning, and you walk outside, and you see a bunch of bilbies, little rabbit-like creatures. And you see these bilbies running around. Some of them have whitish color. Some of them are a brownish color. Some of them a darker gray. Um, some of them are here. Some of them are eating grass. Some of them are scurrying into their homes. Um, but you see a bunch of individual bilbies. Now, looking at these bilbies, you the you begin it's it's the phantasm of of one of these particular bilbies is impressed in your mind, and the active intellect then abstracts the gray color from this bilby, and it abstracts its the size of its tail, and it, and it abstracts from its location these these individual particular notes from the bilby, and to your left with the essence of bilbiness, and this universal is then impressed onto the passive intellect, and the passive intellect then seeing it says, oh, okay, this is a bilby, this is what it means to be a bilby, this is the common universal nature of all bilbies, and this is how the mind conceives of, of an idea. And so from this, it is clear that knowledge is not innate nor do we determine it. As McInerney states, the human mind is measured by the things it knows, meaning that the things in the world, not the mind, constitute the standard for truth. The mind is shaped by reality. It does not shape reality. So now we'll talk about universals in particular. So St. Thomas tells us that our intellect cannot know the singular and material things directly and primarily. The reason for this is that the principle of singularity in material things is individual matter, whereas our intellect, as have said above, understands 
by abstracting the intelligible species from such matter. Now, what is abstracted from individual matter is, uni is the universal. Hence, our intellect knows directly the universal only. So this is going to cause a bit of debate, um, as we'll see in the next slide. But basically here what he's saying is that first and foremost, the intellect is concerned with the knowledge of the universal species, the, the essence of, of the thing we're apprehending. However, this is not to say that the intellect cannot know individuals or particulars. St. Thomas goes on to say regarding these singulars that indirectly and as it were by a kind of reflection, the intellect can know the singular because, as have said above, even after abstracting the intelligible species, the intellect, in order to understand, needs to turn to the phantasms in which it understands the species. So because we have to turn to phantasms to understand things by way of, of reflecting back, in a certain sense, he's saying that we can come to knowledge of the singular thing before us, but that the intellect is primarily concerned with the universal, with the essence of the thing we're apprehending, not just, I'm looking at this tree, I'm looking at a tree. So, obviously, the, the singular cannot be the proper object of the intellect, at least not the singular by itself. Not because it is singular, but as Frederick Copleston states, because it is material and the mind knows only by abstracting from matter as a principle of individuation, that is, from this or that matter. So since the particular matter, no particular matter is included in the universal, singulars cannot be known directly by the intellect, but only through reflection. And as I said, this is going to cause a bit of 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 debate as to as to what exactly St. Thomas is saying the proper object of the intellect is. So now we'll begin talking about the proper object of the intellect. And as I said, I think this is the most confusing part of of, uh, of St. Thomas's epistemology. Um, not because it's it is difficult to understand, of course, but I don't think it's the most difficult thing to understand about his epistemology. But I think it's the most confusing because there are so many differing opinions, even amongst Thomists, as to what the proper object of the intellect actually is. So there are two main differing, differing views on this. So the first is that the proper object of the intellect is simply the essence of a material thing. So this is due to the fact that, as we mentioned, the intellect apprehends the individual through the senses, as St. Thomas would say, and the imagination. And therefore, he continues, for the intellect to understand actually its proper object, it must of necessity turn to the phantasms in order to perceive the universal nature existing in the individual. But if the proper object of our in intellect were a separate form, or if, as the Platonists say, the natures of sensible things subsisted, subsisted apart from the individual, there would be no need for the intellect to turn to the phantasms whenever it understands. So this 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 quote I think seems to go both seems to go both ways. He doesn't explicitly state this is the proper object of the intellect, as we mentioned in in the previous in the in the previous slide. Um, that the intellect you know he says that the intellect know directly direct directly knows the universal only. However, here it's, it, you know, in this quote, he's, he's reiterating the point that the universal exists within the thing, but also the point that we know through the senses. And due to this, the proper object of the intellect, because of this process of knowing through the senses, the, uh, the proper object of the intellect is the essence of a material thing. And it's not, it's not being as such because we can't really know singulars directly, nor can we know spiritual things directly. Um, not that we can't know spiritual things or singulars at all. The, the people who would who would uh, propose this this view would not would not say such a thing. However, spiritual knowledge is still dependent on the phantasms, as Frederick Copleston states, owing to its embodied state and the necessity of the conversio ad phantasma. The human intellect has, in its embodied state, 
the sensible object as the natural and proper object of its apprehension. So from there, it seems pretty convincing that the in, that that the essence of a material thing is the intellect's proper object. But Copleston continues, it the intellect does not lose its orientation towards being in general. So the intellect can go beyond the senses and isn't restricted to merely material essences, but as Coppelson states, it can only do this insofar as the immaterial objects are manifested in and through the sensible world. So we still have to turn to phantasms in order to understand God and angels. We can't think of nothing. We can't we can't think of immateriality. It just it's beyond our, our comprehension because we're so dependent on, on the senses for our knowledge. But in as much as things are manifested to us through the senses, and as much as spiritual things are manifested to us through the senses, we can come to a sort of sort of finite knowledge of them. Um, that's how we're able to come to knowledge of God is is through these proofs through the senses where where Saint Thomas starts with the existence of things in the world um, to prove God's existence. However, there are others who hold a different view, and they say that the proper object of the intellect is being. So St. Thomas tells us that the intellect regards its object under the common ratio of being. He goes on to state in a later question that everything is knowable so far as it is an act, and not so far as it is in potentiality. For a thing is a being, and is true, and therefore knowable, according as it is actual. So, this is because the mind does not simply, the intellect, does not simply know the universal, nor does it know the singular, simply. It knows the universal within the singular. In the process of, ex of abstraction, as you will recall, we said that the universal is presented to the passive intellect, and that the intellect knew first the universal, and after a sort of reflection, knows the singular. But because, but it's precisely because of this, because the intellect knows the, the singular actually, because the intellect knows the singular actually existing in reality as well, the proper object of the intellect cannot just be the universal, but actually existing thing which we know in the world through our senses. And as we said, this the senses can can manifest to us um, a, a certain level of, of knowledge of spiritual things. So this, thank you, Professor, uh, Professor Studi, he tells us, he, he explains that this being isn't necessarily the being studied in metaphysics, but just, a, just an awareness that something is before our mind. So I think uh, somebody could object to this and and say that we know the because we know the essence of of things that are not real, such as dragons or things that did exist but no longer exist, such as dinosaurs. The proper object of the intellect is well the essences of material things. However, I would argue that the proper object of the intellect is being. For just because such things never existed or no longer exist, we still must be presented with a singular representation at the very least, or image of the object, in order to know its essence. There must be, at the end of the day, I think, because there, there must be singulars in order for there to be universals in the first place, because due to the fact that there are no, if there are no singulars to abstract from, there can't be any universal essences. So I think I would agree with those who hold the view that, who hold the second view for, as D.Q. McInerney states, knowledge involves both an awareness of the former essence of a thing as well as the individuality of the thing as an existing thing. So given that we can have knowledge, at least indirectly, of spiritual things or immaterial things how would how would saint thomas say that we know we know god um now obviously god cannot be fully comprehended by the human intellect due, due to the fact that 
the human mind is is finite, whereas God obviously is is infinite. But uh, we can, in a certain way, come to know Him through through negation. Uh, since our intellects find it truly impossible to comprehend fully, at least such a being, it is helpful for us to come to knowledge of God by way of negation. This does not mean that knowledge of God is devoid of all content, but rather that we can come to a better understanding of what God is by discounting or stripping away, so to speak, what he is not. So we see this most clearly in the five ways of St. Thomas. Um, and this comes from Professor Jonathan Studi and D.Q. McInerney. So in the first way, we see that God does not change. He has no potency, and therefore he is immutable. In the second way, we learn that God is uncaused. Since he is an uncaused cause, he does not receive his causal power from another, and is thus omnipotent or all-powerful. The third way shows that God is not dependent on another. Thus, he is the one necessary being. From the fourth way, we see that God is not limited in, in his possession of the transcendentals of goodness, truth, etc. And thus, his nature is identical to, to these things. Finally, the fifth way demonstrates that God has no end but himself. Thus, he is the good to which all things are directed. This is, this is helpful, um, of course, but this is not to say that we can't ever predicate anything positively of God. Um, there is another way we can speak of God, and we would call we would do this through way of analogy. So now we come to our final slide, in which we'll talk about our knowledge of God uh, and how we can speak of Him positively. And this is done by way of analogy. So there are three ways in which we can predicate things: either equivocally, univocally, or analogously. So in equivocal language, a term has two completely different meanings. For example, one can say, I saw a saw. Obviously, we know that this does not mean that someone can see the act of seeing. No, we all know in the first case, saw, the past tense of the verb see. And in the second case, saw means a jagged blade attached to the handle, attached to a handle for cutting things. They have completely different meanings. Obviously, we cannot speak of God in this way using this sort of language, for we can't mean two totally different things when we say God is good and man is good. We would have no idea what was trying to be conveyed, and we couldn't have any knowledge of God, and all arguments for his existence would be fallacious. As D.Q. McInerney states, if a word like goodness were to be considered equivocal, there would be a complete breakdown in coherent communication. There, there'd simply be no point of trying to, to talk about God or describe what he's like because we, we'd have completely different meanings for, for his attributes that, that we find in creatures. The next way of speaking about thing by, about the next way of predicating things is by way of univocal language. In this case, a term has one and only one meaning. The term intelligent for example, I can say Sir William is intelligent, and I can say Sir John is intelligent. Intelligence has the exact same meaning in both sentences. However, we cannot speak of God in this way either. St. Thomas tells us that this is because univocal predication is impossible between God and creatures. The reason of this is that every effect which is not an adequate result of the power of the, of the efficient cause receives the simil similitude of the agent not in its full degree, but in a measure that falls short. So, that what is divided and multiplied in the effects resides in the agent simply and in the same manner. So, St. Thomas here is saying that we cannot predicate univocally when speaking about God due to the fact that God and creatures simply do not exist in the same manner. So, when one says all created things have being, we mean we mean such a thing the same way. So, for example, chickens have being and giraffes have being, meaning their existence is separate from their essence. God, however, does not exist in such a way, for in him essence and essay are one. 
We can separate any sort of perfection from the creature who possesses the perfection. We can imagine someone who is good, and we can imagine that person is not good. We cannot, how, um, however, imagine goodness simply, in essence that which is goodness. For it is merely an extrinsic quality in creatures. It's given to the creatures, whereas in God it is of his essence to be good. Now, uh, the Franciscan Blessed John Duns Scotus, uh, he put forth a concept of univocal being. And while I'm not claiming I'm competent enough to know exactly what he was talking about or to fully refute his argument, um, I can only offer uh, my own opinion. So Scotus, his concept of being, as I said, was, was univocal, and this makes things a bit more complicated. So, for example, if you say God is and a creature is, now, here, Scotus is not saying that God and creatures are opposed to nothingness in the same way. However, as, Koppel, as Frederick Copleston tells us, his point is that if you, mean by, if you mean by is simply the opposite of nothingness or not being, then you can use the word being of God and creatures in the same sense. I would argue, however, that by is we don't merely mean the opposite of nothingness. Because God simply is. Creatures, however, can be or not be. When we say God is, it implies necessity. So by, by using the word is, I don't think we can just merely say it means the opposite of nothingness. Because it's, it, it exists in God in a, higher, in a higher way, in a more perfect way. It's necessary to him, whereas to us, we, we only, it's, only, it's only accidental. It's only a potential. So, um, I think that, obviously, this, this leads us to that, that analogical predication is really the only way in which we can, we can speak to God. Now, there are different forms of analogy, which we don't really have the time to get into, but um, one of the most important is that of intrin intrinsic attribution, and it, and it involves uh, causality. So, in this case, every analogate really does possess the predicated term, but in different amounts. So we can predicate being of both God and Sir John. For God, it really does exist, and I'm sure there's a Sir John out there somewhere that really does exist. However, we predicate being first and primarily to God, since he has being in a most perfect way. His nature is to be. Everything else, however, merely participates in this being. This is to say that properly speaking, we can only assign essay to God alone, but it, but is pre we can only assign essay to God alone, but it is predicated of all other beings because they receive their being from subsistent being, subsistent existence itself. Although it would be nice to go more in depth to with the arguments presented by by Scotus and uh, more in depth detail on. Uh, analogical predication, I simply have not the time nor the competence to do such a thing. Here are the sources I used for this project. And here are the sources I used for the photographs.